and welcome back. In this session, we're going to talk about data modifications, specifically how you can change data that's in your database. And there are four statements that we're going to talk about, the insert statement, update statement, the delete statement, and the truncate statement. Today we're going to start with a demo right off the bat, a demo of some insert statements. All right, the way we put data into a table is using the insert statement. And you start insert statement with the word insert and the word into and you tell it the, the place that you're going to put the data. In our case, we're going to add some data today to the location table. That's in the production schema, the location table. Let's take a look at that table first. The type. Let's go ahead and look at our production, the, what we have currently in the table. You can see there's 14. And we're going to go ahead and add some locations to this. So somebody's come to us and said, hey, we need another location. We need a location for the pick line. OK. So what we're going to do is we're going to insert into the location. And we look here, we've got uh, first thing we do is we're going to tell SQL Server the columns that we're going to put data into. We're going to put something into name, cost rate, availability. And uh, we're going to leave the modified date. Now you see availability came up blue, and that's because availability is a keyword. So as you remember, we talked about uh, using double quotes and brackets as identifiers in our, in our previous session. We were talking about data types, the second data type section. So I'm going to go ahead and put brackets around this to indicate that this is an object, and I'm not using the availability keyword. And then I'm going to tell it the values that I want to put into it. And the values I want to insert in here are for the name, I'm going to put pick line. And for the cost rate, I'm going to put zero. For the availability, I'm going to put 55. And those are numbers that I just made up. I want to show you one other thing here really quick. And I'm going to highlight the schema and table name here. And on the keyboard, I'm going to hit Alt F1. What that does is it actually brings up some information about the table that I have highlighted. It gives me the name and the owner, the columns, and some other information here below. What I can see, what I'm looking for here is one is that the location ID is an identity. So I'm not actually giving the location ID up here. I'm not going to insert it in. I'm not giving it a value. I'm giving the name a value, the cost rate a value, and the availability a value. I'm not giving it a value, but that's okay because SQL Server is going to create the location ID for me because it's an identity column. The other column that's up here is the modified date, and I'm not giving it a value either. Let's look and see what happens when we do this. Okay, one row affected. I neglected here to zoom in. Let's go ahead and make this a little bigger. One row affected. When we go look at our locations, we can see that our pick line was added with the values that we specified, pick line, 0, and 55. But also a modified date was added. and uh, this is the current date. This is the time that I'm actually creating this presentation, September 23rd at 10.24 a.m. And if I go back and if I look at that information again, Alt F1, when I look, when I scroll down here, I can see that there is actually a constraint on the modified date, a default constraint of get date. And we'll have another session where we talk about functions, but I'm going to talk about functions as, uh, that, that come up as we're learning other things. And so I'll talk just a second here about get date. What get date is is a function that returns the current date and time. So there is a default on this table that says if they don't provide a modified date, then go ahead and stick in the current date and time as the modified date. Now I could have added modified date up here and actually specified the date that I wanted to go in as a modified date. In fact, let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to add a modified date. I'm going to do January 1st, 2013. And what I'm going to do here also is I'm going to take out the list of columns. Okay. Oh, I got to change. Thank you. Pick line. The locations have to be unique. So I do pick line two, and there we go. It inserted one row affected. When we go now and look at our location data, I have to scroll down a bit now. Pick line two is inserted, and it gave it used the date that I passed in. Now I took off the column list. If you don't provide a column list, you have to provide a value for all of the columns in the table, which I've done. 
all four columns of the table minus the location ID, which SQL Server creates for which SQL Server creates the value for me. I provided a value for each of the columns in that table, so I can I don't have to have the column list. SQL Server expects the columns to be in the same order that they're listed in the table, and I provided them in that order as well. If I mixed up the order here, it would assume that uh, let's say I moved pick line two to the end, it would assume that the zero is in the name, that the 55 is the cost rate, and that 1-1-2013 was the availability, and pick line two is the modified date. Uh, since SQL Server can't convert all of those data types to the ones that match the table, that would have that's a query that would have failed. It wouldn't have actually inserted the value because it wouldn't have been able to to turn those values into the ones that it needed to actually put into the table. All right. Let's go back. I'm going to undo to get the columns names back. Okay, with these three columns, I'm going to remove my modify date. I'm going to let SQL Server provide that for me. But let's say I wanted to add more than one row at a time. One way that we can do that is by just providing the values that we want. So we're going to do pick line three. I'm going to copy this entire piece from open to end parenthesis. I'm going to add it here two more times change it to pick line four and five and I'm going to change a couple of the other values to okay this will allow me to insert three rows in a single statement what I've done here is for each set I've given the values that should be inserted and I've put commas between uh, the, the uh, distinct or complete sets okay three rows affected and again, when I go to look at the table, I scroll down, it inserted all three rows for me, all at once. This is going to be something important for you, probably for the test, but also for working in, uh, in your production system to realize, to know how to insert more than one row at a time. It comes in very handy. Next thing I want to show you is what to do when your table has all default values. I have a table that I've created in this database. Uh, called all defaults. Let's take a look at what's in there. Okay, this table has four columns, an ID, and column one, column two, column three. It's got a little bit of data in each row. If I highlight this, I do Alt F1. Actually, let's do something different this time. When I hit Alt F1 inside of Management Studio, what Management Studio is actually doing is executing a store procedure. This procedure is called SP Help. You can see when I execute this with all defaults, it gives me the results that you saw before when I was looking at production.location. When I highlight the name of the table and do Alt F1, behind the scenes, Management Studio is actually sending SP Help and then that name to SQL Server to execute. This is not a SQL Server feature, this is a Management Studio feature. But it's a really nice one that I really like. It saves me from having to type this up and gives me a lot of information about a table really quick. One thing, the thing I want you to notice about this table is that every column has a default. The ID column is an identity, so SQL Server is going to provide that. Column one is a date time, and it has a default of sys date time. Uh, sys date time is a lot like get date that we saw in the previous table, but it returns instead of a date time data type, it returns a date time two data type. So this is appropriate default for our column one. Column two has a default of hello world. So if we don't provide it the var card there, it will, it will provide that. And column three, you can see there's not a default down here. I'm already at the bottom. There's no more default, but it is nullable. It allows nulls. So what we can do with this table now is we can actually insert into the table without providing any values at all. Type all defaults and we use the keyword default values. What this will do is it will insert a default value, a row into that table with all of the default values. Okay, one row affected. Let me go back and look we can see that it inserted a row with all the defaults. So this is the current date and time. Here is the bar car field. And for the last column, it put a null in. That column didn't have a default, but it allowed nulls, and so it put a null in there for me. Now in practice, to be honest, 
In all of the years that I've used SQL Server, I've never actually done an insert using just default values in production. Uh, so you may find a place <laughs> where this works and you can turn theory into practice. I haven't yet found a place where I can turn this theory into practice. But it's something you need to realize, uh, possibly for the exam, that there is, a, there is the potential here to insert a row specifying no values at all and letting all, each of the columns take their default value. All right. Up here I showed you one way to insert multiple values into a table. I'm going to show you another way. Let's imagine that someone from the production team came to you and said, hey, you know what, we've got all of these, uh, all of these rows in our location table, <clears throat> but we need to add in several others. And the ones that we need to add in are the departments. We need to add a location for each of the company departments. Okay, well we can go look and see what those departments are. That's in the human resources schema in the department table. You can see here there's a list of 16 departments. We need to add each one of these as a location into our location table. Well, we could type out 16 insert statements, or we could type out 16 value inserts like we did up here. But what we can actually do as well is we can actually insert directly into the location table from a select query. And it almost sounds exactly like you would speak it out. You say, I want to insert into the production location table the values that I need to get out of the human resources department table. And we're going to specify for this one the column names again. The name, the cost rate, and the availability. And what we're going to do is we're going to select the name out of the human resources table. Now the cost rate, we're going to go ahead and say that our cost rate is 10 <clears throat> and our availability is uh, 122. Now this select query here gives us a result that matches exactly the data types and the columns that we need for our insert. So we can actually do this insert, and this is actually the, the phrasing here, insert in a production location, the name of the columns, and then the select statement that provides the columns for production location, production dot location. Okay, 16 rows effective. Now when we go look at our production locations, we can actually see that down here at the bottom, we have all of our human resources departments in there as locations. Okay, so now we've talked about two ways to get multiple sets of data in. Insert into with multiple values, and insert into with a select. The third way to get uh, multiple values into a table all at once is using a select into. For this one, let's for this one, let's imagine that we had um, we have all of our products. Let's look at our products. This is the table we looked at in our previous demo that has all the objects in it. Let's say we wanted to make a quick backup of this table. We wanted the same structure, the same data, all of the rows. We wanted to put it into a backup copy. We could do a select into. What this will do is it will take the select and it will put all of the information from that select into the product backup table. 504 rows. Now we go take a look at product backup. You can see that it has all of the exact same rows that the, the product table does. Now what we did here, you may notice that I never created the product backup table. The select into creates the table that the data is going to go into. So the production.product backup table is created by this statement. In fact, if I tried to run this again, it's going to fail because it's going to try to create the table and it already exists. But that's one of the big differences here between the insert into select and the select into. The select into creates a table. The insert into select adds rows to a table that already exists. Now, there's one interesting piece here that I want to just bring out, and this is a really cool feature, and this is one that I have used several times. What would happen if you added a WHERE clause here? Well, this would create the product backup. I'm going to create product backup 2. 
it would create the product backup table and it would only put in the rows that matched my where clause. So here I could do where color equals red and my product backup, let's do red table, would have all the rows out of product that had a red color. What happens if I change this where clause to something that's always false? How often is one equal to zero? One is never equal to zero. For every row in the product table, it's going to look and say, does one equal zero for this row? No. Does one equal zero for this row? No. So this would actually return zero rows. So what happens, I'm going to change this back to product backup two. What happens if I execute this query for one equals zero? It should fail, right? Actually, no, it doesn't fail, but it didn't add any rows either. So what, what do I get out of this table? Did it create the table? It created the table, but it didn't put any rows in it. If I do Alt F1 on this table to get the data, all of the column types, all the collations, all of the identity, all of my constraints, everything about this table has been copied over into the product backup too, but none of the data. <clears throat> this is a really neat shortcut here to make a copy, a perfect copy of the table without any of the data that's in it. You just need a shell. This is a really nice way to do that really quick using where one equals zero. Okay, let's go back to our slides. All right, a couple reminders about the insert statements. When you're doing an insert, you need to provide all non-null and non-default values. If there's a column that doesn't allow nulls and doesn't have a default provided, a default specified, you have to put a value in for it or you can't do the insert. You either have to provide a column list that says these are the columns that I'm inserting into, or if you omit that column list, you have to provide a value for every single column. You saw that in the example where I took the column list off and I provided a value for every column that worked fine. For every column that you're putting a value in, you need to provide an implicitly convertible value for that column something that SQL Server can implicitly convert. Now, you remember we talked about implicit conversion in um, the data type, the data type uh, session where we talked about data types and converting. Implicitly convertible, convertible means that SQL Server can convert it on its own without you specifying. Explicitly convertible are the ones where you have to use the cast or convert function to convert it. So you have to provide an implicitly convertible value. Now if you have something that's not implicitly convertible, but it's explicitly convertible, you can go ahead and put that cast or convert inside your statement so the conversion happens before the insert occurs and it will go into your table fine. You need to make sure that your values are convertible. Um, and you also need to know really how to insert more than one row at once. And we talked about those three. And remember the difference between the insert into and the select into, and we just talked about that a minute ago. So make sure you understand the difference between those two. Uh, that would be an excellent question to show up on the test. I don't know if it's on there or not, but that would be a great one to put in there. It would be to have a question that says, hey, I've got this table, I need to put data into it, which of these statements will do it? And you'll need to know that the insert into will put the data in, but the select into won't because the table already exists. Or vice versa, the table doesn't exist, the insert into will fail because the table is not there, and the select into will succeed because it will create the table for you. All right. So remember that about inserts. Let's go now and let's do a quick look at changing and removing data. We're going to work with the location table again. Let's expand this up so everybody can see just fine. There we go. Okay, so here's the data we have in our location table. And let's assume that someone comes to us and says, you know what, you, you added all these departments and that's great, but it really shouldn't be research and development. We call it R&D. So let's go ahead and rename that location to R&D. We can do that using an update statement. Update statement starts with the word update. And then you tell it the table that you're going to change. You tell it what you want the values to be. I'm going to tell it which rows. In this case, it is 100. Research developers will call them 100. So this will go to the production location, production dot location table, and it will make the name be equal, the name column be equal to R and D, where the location ID is equal to 100. Okay, one row affected. 
And when I look at my production location table again, see that it's now R&D. Now what would happen if I left the location ID off? Let's say I was changing the cost rate. I didn't have a where clause. In this case, SQL Server will update, since you haven't specified which rows to update, it'll update every row. 35 rows affected. When I go look at my location table, I can see that all of my cost rates are now four. Let's go back to where we were working with the name. <clears throat> One other thing that we can do here, we've, we've, we've specified a, a constant, a specific value that we wanted the name to be. We can also use information that's found elsewhere on the row to determine what we want the name to be. So let's say that, um, let's say we're going to change the cost rate. And we want the cost rate to be equal to the number of characters in the name. Well, there's a function that tells us the number of characters in a string, and it's called len. Len name will tell us how many characters are in the name column. Let's go ahead and take our where clause off. We're going to update every single row, the cost rate for every single row. 35 rows affected. Now when we come and look, the cost rate is different for each row. For each row, it took the length of the name for that row and assigned that to be the value for the cost rate. So tool crib. 4 and 4 with a space in between, that's 9 characters. Sheet metal racks, that's uh, 5 and 5 and 5 with 2 spaces in between, so that's 15 plus 2 is 17. Paint shop is a 5 letter word, a space, that's 6 and then 4, that's 10. So for each row, the cost rate has now become a function of the length in the name. Now, <clears throat> we haven't tied these two columns together. This was a one time update and it did the update based on the values right then of the length of the name. If we went back and changed any of these names, it, the cost rate wouldn't automatically adjust. Uh, to do that, we would need to have what's called a computed column. We'll talk about that in a future session where we talk about creating tables. But for the update, the update happens at one point in time and then it's finished and completed. All right, let's talk about how we get some data out of here. We get data out of a table using the delete statement. Let's go back to our uh, product table, the product backup table that we created. Okay, we have our product backup table. We can go ahead and delete from production.productbackup, and that will remove the rows. You can see here that it removed 504 rows. If we go to our select. Just copy and paste here. Do the select, you can see that there are no rows there. Deleting doesn't get rid of the table, it doesn't remove the table, it just removes the rows from the table. Here we did our delete without a where clause, and so it matched on every single row and deleted all the rows out of the table. In order to, to actually get rid of the table, we actually have to do a drop. Doing a drop will actually get rid of the table. And now let's go undo here. If we do our select, the product, the, the table's not actually there. So let's go ahead and recreate it. Okay. If you remember, remember from the last one, the select select into creates the table, so it recreated the table that we dropped. Now, if we wanted to target a specific row, we could add a from clause. Delete from production.productbackup, where product ID, let's just pick a product ID at random. Oh, I guess I need to go look and find one. Let's just scroll, let's just pick one here, 316. One row affected, and now when we go look at our product, the, the row's gone. It's no longer there. We can also use some of the statements that we saw in our select clause to help restrict the rows that are deleted. Let's take a look at using top. First, uh, let's look at select star from the 
let's look at our data here where a flag equals one. Okay, so we have 238 rows that have a make flag of one. But for some reason, let's say we didn't want to delete them all at one time. We want to delete them in groups. We could delete them in groups using the top function. So all I'm going to do is going to do delete top 100. So that'll delete 100 rows from production.product backup where the make flag equals 1. So when I run this, you can see here, sure enough, 100 rows affected. If I run it again, 100 rows affected again. When I run it the third time, there's only 38 rows affected. There were 238 rows, so it deleted 100 and 100. When it went to delete another 100, it couldn't delete 100. It could only delete 38 because that's all that was left. So in this case, we were in this situation with this example, we were able to uh, delete our, our rows out of our table just for the ones that had to make flag equals one, because we still have the other rows in there. So all the other rows are in there. We just got rid of all the make flag one, make flag equals one columns, and we were able to do it in three batches. If we run it again, we'll see that there are no rows returned. It didn't actually delete anything because it wasn't able to find any rows that had to make flag equals one. Now another way to get data out of a table is using a truncate command. You just have a truncate table and the table name. Truncate removes data from the table, but it do, does it a little differently than uh, a delete does. Truncate can't take a where clause. A truncate always deletes all of the rows in the table. Uh, truncate also runs really, really quickly. And uh, our next slide will talk a little bit about why that happens. But a truncate table is another option to removing data from the table if you're trying to remove all of the data from the table. All right, let's go back to the slides and we'll talk a little bit about some of these. Truncating versus delete. When you use a truncate, if you have any triggers on the table, those are skipped. Now, I know we haven't talked about triggers yet, but if we waited till triggers to talk about truncating, you wouldn't have gotten truncating until late in the session. So remember this for when we get to triggers, that when you truncate a table, triggers are not executed. Uh, I mentioned before, uh, the truncate does the entire table, and the truncate is typically faster. The reason is it's not deleting row at a time, it's deallocating entire pages. So it's removing data from the table in 8K chunks. Instead of working a row at a time, working at a page at a time allows it to move much quicker. Now, if you have foreign key references to the table that you're trying to truncate, there's a reference to that table, uh, you won't be able to use truncate. You'll actually have to use delete. And that's to make sure that those foreign keys are enforced. Or are enforced. All right. To kind of uh, solidify some of the concepts here, uh, I've created just a short quiz. So let's step through this together and see, uh, see how well you can remember some of the things we've talked about. I won't do this with every, with every session, but I've got one here. Let's go ahead and do that. Our first question here, we've got a table. It's a patient table with a patient ID, first name, last name, age, and birth date. And I've got the data types and the nullability specified out there. And now I have this insert statement. Insert into patient values, and then a 1, Mark, Smithson, and 37. So my question is, will this insert statement succeed? The answer is no. And the reason that this one will not succeed is right here. Uh, the birth date was not provided. So we have a column that's not provided, and uh, it's not here, nor did we provide a, a column list. So because we didn't provide a column list, we had to provide values for all the columns. We didn't provide a column for birth date, so that, <coughs> excuse me, this query will fail. All right, so here's our second query. The table's the same, and what we've done is we've added the birth date. So now we have the birth date, so we're providing values for all the columns. So my question is, will this succeed? The answer here again is no. The reason being is that this value here, 825.1974, cannot be implicitly converted to a date time two. Oh, my arrow went the wrong way. This way. Bidirectional, I guess. You cannot convert this value to a date time two. So this query will fail. We are providing a value for each column, but it's not implicitly convertible. All right. Now we have fixed our implicitly convertible problem here by putting single quotes around it. And, oops, not an arrow. I looked for a box. SQL Server can convert this value to 
a date time too, and no, that is not my birth date. Uh, convert it to a date time too. So now, will this query succeed? The answer is no. Again, I was a bit tricky here, and the reason that it won't succeed is because we are not providing all the values. We've got the first name, patient ID, the age, the birth date, but we haven't indicated what this is for. We didn't provide the column here. So this one will fail too, and what it'll tell us is, hey, you've given me more columns in the, in the values than in the insert, so uh, what do you want me to do with this last one? Not exactly sure. So it will fail. Ah, here we go. Now they're lined up. Well, this will succeed. We've got patient ID, first name, last name, age. So we have our column list, and we have the exact values provided for that column list. Everything's implicitly convertible. Will this one succeed? The answer again here is no, because the birth date doesn't allow nulls, and we didn't provide a default, the table doesn't have a default value for it. So it will give us an error in saying that we didn't, uh, we didn't, uh, we didn't provide the BD. Okay, number five. Now we've provided the birth date, provided a value. We have five columns, and we have five values. Will this one succeed? This one's probably the easy one. No, will not succeed because the birth date is listed as not null, and we're providing a null value, so we can't put a null in that column. So the insert will fail. Ah, are you sick of this table yet? <laughs> Here's another one. This one has solved all the problems we had in the previous one. We have five columns all specified out, five values all specified out, implicitly convertible. You can see the obvious question here is this very long string. The string happens to have, if you, can, if you want to count it, you can, but there's 59 characters in the string. Will SQL Server allow you to insert it? The answer here is no. You would think that it would truncate, but it does not. SQL Server will give you an overflow error telling you that you're trying to put a value in that's too big and it won't fit into the VARCAR 50. All right, here's the next one. Will this one work? It seems to resolve all of the issues we had before. Five columns, five values, implicitly convertible, not a big long string. And indeed, this is the one that will succeed. All right, our next question here deals with clustered indexes. Now, we haven't talked about clustered index yet. There is a session we'll talk about indexing and clustered indexes. But here is something that I have heard before. If you select from a table that has a clustered index, index the results will be returned in the order that the rows exist in the clustered index. And so the question is, is that true or false? And the answer, of course, is false. This will be the fourth time that I've talked about it. No matter what you hear, if you don't include an order by, the results will not be returned in the order that you, they'll not be returned in any specific order. You're not guaranteed that they'll come back in any order at all. Well, you are guaranteed they will come back in an order, but they're not guaranteed that they will come back in the same order or in the order that you want them to come back in. But there will be some order to it. This may be very difficult to determine what that is. All right, next question. You have a query with the following order by. Which of the columns must be in the select? So we're order by type, ascending, color, descending, and location. Let me throw this one in there. Which direction will location be ordered, ascending or descending? From smallest to largest or largest to smallest? The answer to that one is it'll be from smallest to largest because ascending is the default. I could have left the ASC off here and the query would have executed the same. So the question here, I have type, color, and location in the order by which one of them need to be in the select? The answer here, although we didn't talk about it when we were going through the demo, is none of them do. You can order by a column that doesn't exist in the select. That means you won't be able to see the order, but it will be sorted correctly. All right, this is our last question on the quiz. Will this query execute? We have select hello world as result this, of course, is using an a, a column alias as a result, where 1 equals and then 2 in single quotes. Notice we're missing a from clause, and we have something really odd going down here in our where clause. Will this query execute? As a matter of fact, it will. 
where 1 equals 2, these are implicitly convertible. And what SQL Server will do is it will actually take the 2 and it will convert it up to be a 1. You remember that we talked about uh, this when we were doing the data types. And we specifically gave an example with ints and var cars where it converts the var cars to become ints. So this will convert it to be where 1 equals 2. And we actually saw in the demo where we did 0 equals 1. Well, this will be the same thing. This where clause will never be true. Uh, so what we'll get is no rows, but we will get a single column. The column will be named result, but it won't have any data in it. There will be no rows. It's kind of an interesting query, but it will actually execute successfully, even though it doesn't give us anything re of real worth back. All right, thank you for joining me today as we talked about uh, our data modification statements. If you have any questions, you're welcome to stop by my desk, and uh, I can answer your questions there. You're also welcome to send me an email or connect up with me on Twitter at DBA Chad. Thanks, and we'll see you again in the next session.